It's now a great pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, somebody who's uh, a friend and colleague of many years, and that's uh, Dr. Jonathan Napier. Jonathan uh, is a, uh, a principal investigator at uh, the Rothamsted Institute in the UK, and he is, uh, I would say, one of the world authorities on uh, plant lipid metabolism. Uh, he's probably done more work on metabolic engineering uh, of lipids over the, uh, plant lipids over the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, than just about any other uh, lab in the world. The exciting thing is to see uh, the, the uh, confluence of genomics and lipid metabolism in enabling us basically to find genes from a wide variety of organisms uh, and as a result assemble novel pathways in this way. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Jonathan come and talk and his title is Metabolic Engineering of the Omega-3 Long Chain Polyunsaturated Fatty Acid Biosynthetic Pathway in Transgenic Camelina. Jonathan. Thanks very much, Morris. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, uh, 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 both to talk to you as a, uh, uh, as a conference, but also to, to meet a lot of friends and colleagues. And Morris has, uh, was a great supporter of our work when we were at Rothamsted, you know, and I knew him before then because he, you know, he, he was also a, a great exponent of, of, of plant sciences and, and lipid research even before he came to Rothamsted. So the story I'm going to tell you today, I apologize for the exceptionally long title that, that, that uh, I put up there. It's sort of, if you want to think about it, um, you could think of it more as um, making fish oils in plants. I guess that's the, that's the simple story. Um, and what, what we've got on this slide here, let me just see if I've got a pointer. Uh, and this, I really like this picture. It's, so this is a, a, an, an artist who was, uh, did an installation at Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And he, was, uh, he doesn't know anything about science, but he was inspired by our work to make, on making fish oils in plants and made this visual projection onto uh, a, a, an exhibit, an old um, uh, uh, Roman statue. Uh, and this is his, his uh, uh, optical representation of a camelina plant. So... Uh, so uh, people know what we're doing, I guess, even if we don't know what we're doing. We're the <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> right. So I, I, we're all very familiar with this. Uh, and, uh, but actually, I don't think you can put these sort of slides up too, too many times, because there are plenty of people, especially in academia and university research, who are, who are well, I was going to say blissfully, uh, unaware of the sustainable de development goals. I think blissfully is not the right word. I think they are, they don't realize the importance of, uh, of their contribution to meeting these goals and actually the, the importance, uh, well in fact the imperative of them working towards these goals and being aware of them. I think it's really important. Uh, so I always put this up and I encourage people in my team to be, to be aware of them and think about how their work can contribute to the, to the goals. So, but of course you know, I'm interested in, in the fact that, as I says in this slide here, food security is not just about the provision of enough calories. Actually, now across the planet, and we, we heard this in the, in the first day, there's a, there's a spectre uh, stalking the globe, which is not as a consequence of, of under, under consumption, it's a consequence of overconsumption, overconsumption of bad food. Uh, and, and these are, by what I mean, these. these uh, metabolic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, 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 and, other, uh, uh, and other pathologies that are, are having a massive impact across the planet. And this, I think this is a really uh, a terrifying statistic, sorry, that, that, that the, amount, the number of people on the planet with, with type 2 diabetes is, is approaching, well, it's moving towards half a billion people. So that's one in 11 people on the planet. Now, this is not a number I made up. This, this is taken off the WHO website. That's a truly terrifying statistic. Now, uh, what, what makes, it, makes it even worse is that I think about it, you think about it not just in terms of the blight on individual people who have these pathologies, but also the burden on the public health healthcare systems, the costs associated with treating this, these diseases are, are enormous. Now, just over here on this side, there's the UK cost 
of, uh, of type 2 diabetes. Uh, and if I can see, it, it's, it, it's 14 billion pounds a year. Now, the good news is we've got our Brexit dividend because there was a bus that went around the UK that said we would get 350 million pounds uh, a week back from our fantastic decision to leave the EU. Uh, but that, that, I calculated it, that works out at about 18 billion pounds a year. So we've sort of gobbled up about 80% of our Brexit dividend uh, just to deal with diabetes. Now, that might seem terribly frivolous. But what I'm telling you is that there is, there is an enormous cost so to, to public health systems to basically to, to governments to deal with these pathologies. Uh, and, that's, and that's a real problem. Uh, and, as, and as was a, a stated very clearly and very elegantly uh, on the first day, these, these pathologies, these diseases, are completely blind to geographies or, 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 or uh, to social status and to gender. So this, and this is actually a very old map, so this is uh, from, from 2005, and it shows that you know, the, the incidences of obesity. So predictably, you can see it in, in North America, uh, but you can see it rising in, in, in much less affluent parts of the world. Uh, and, I, I'm, and I think for sure now, it's much more of a problem, especially in places like China and, uh, and the Indian subcontinent. So this, this is a real problem. So why am I telling you all, all of this stuff in a sort of doom-laden fashion? So it's, that's a rather long-winded uh, introduction to try and explain to you why I'm interested in omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3 fish oils. And the reason I'm interested in them is that they have really got, that they have proven uh, uh, roles in reducing our risk of cardiovascular disease. So omega-3 fish oils are, are really important human uh, nutrients. It's really important that we have them in our diet. And unlike lots of things that we're told to eat, there's actually really good evidence that they're good for you. So the evidence is, whether it's epidemiological or genetic or from dietary intervention studies, it's really clear that you should have omega-3 fish oils in your diet and it will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease and those metabolic diseases that I talked about earlier. So, so that's, that, that's a good thing. The only problem is that there's no known plant source available that makes these omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're called omega-3 fish oils for a reason, because they come from fish. So they don't come from plants. But that's a limited natural resource, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So it's, it's, it, it, you know, there's this thing about there being plenty more fish in the sea, and that turns out that's not true. There aren't plenty more fish in the sea. So these are all the drivers that I think, so this is, this is the, sort of, the sort of background to what I've been, in, in the context of what I was telling you about the problems with uh, metabolic diseases and why omega-3 fish oils are an important thing to have in our diet. Uh, and I have to put this slide up, and it's one of Morris's favorite slides, and it's one of my favorite slides. Uh, I just need to tell you before we start that not all omega-3 fatty acids are the same. So omega-3 is a, is, a, is a sort of nomenclature, and it's a badly used nomenclature, even in the scientific literature, but it's certainly used in the, in the popular uh, literature in the, in the media. Uh, so omega-3 fatty acids are found um, in both fish oils and in vegetable oils. Uh, and the, the critical thing is that, so this is, this is a list of the fatty acids you find in, in seed oils. And this is sort of dying on me. I think my pointer is dying. I don't know whether that's... Have you got a spare pointer? Because otherwise I'm going to struggle. Um, so what, but what I'm going to tell you is that so the, these omega-3 fatty acids, you can find omega-3 fatty acids in, in, in vegetable oils. Oh, no, it's just dying. Uh, and you can find, um, what am I saying? So the omega-3 fatty acids you find in vegetable oils, uh, but you can, they're not the same omega-3 fatty acids as you'd find in, in fish oils. So the omega-3 fatty acids that you find in vegetable oils are short-chain, uh, and they have, um, perfect, that was seamless. Now I'm green, perfect. That's much more uh, plant science-y. So, um, uh, what, what was, I'm, I, you know, I, I was working up to a fantastic gag there, but now I've lost my thread. Anyway, so, um, so these are the, the fatty acid profiles of some of different fish oils, and this is different plant uh, vegetable oils. And what you can see is that, that in, in the vegetable, uh, in the vegetables, vegetable oils, 
they do not have any of these long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, which means they're 20 carbons with, with multiple double bonds in them. They don't have any of those fatty acids, whereas the, veg, uh, where the fish oils have those, those fatty acids. They have them in different compositions, and they don't have them at particularly high levels. But these are the key things that give you the health benefits. These are the omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So you have them in fish oils, but you don't have them in any vegetable oil at all. Okay. This is, yeah, okay, right. So th that's the thing to remember. You don't have any of these omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids in any plants. And obviously, that's why we're trying to engineer plants to, ac to accumulate these, fa these fatty acids you find in fish oils. Now, if I had a pound for every time somebody said to me, why are you wasting your time trying to make omega-3 fatty acids in plants? Don't you know that linseed is rich in, 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 in these omega-3 fatty acids? I'd be quite rich, and usually the assumption is that they tell me this, and I'm going to sort of fall to the ground in sort of dismay and, and think, damn, why did I not check Wikipedia or wherever they found their facts? <laughs> but, of course, it's a different type of omega-3 fatty acid. This is alpha-linolenic acid, and it is an omega-3 fatty acid, but it doesn't give you the health benefits. So you can eat a diet that's very rich in linseed or flax, but it's not going to give you the same health benefits as omega-3 fatty acids that you find from fish oils. It just doesn't, and anybody who suggests otherwise really doesn't know the literature. It's these fish oils that give you the health benefits. Right. So, meanwhile, down on the farm, we've been talking a lot about farms, but this is the sort of farm that I'm interested in. So this is a fish farm. And we haven't really talked about fish farming in this conference at all, which is sort of, you know, maybe, you know, maybe understandable. But I think fish farming is, is, is really important because I think if you want to eat animal protein, that this fish farming is the most efficient way to produce animal protein for human consumption, far more efficient than any form of terrestrial uh, uh, production systems. So I think fish farming plays a really important role in feeding the, the seven, eight, nine billion mouths uh, on the planet, and, and that's why it's a huge burgeoning industry. And so, in fact, in the, in the last two or three years, we've gone to a tipping point where now the majority of all the fish that is consumed on the planet has been produced through fish farming, through aquaculture, rather than wild, wild, wild capture. So that's, you know, that's a really important statistic, and I bet you most people don't know that. Because, you know, I mean, you could argue fish farming is not really very visible because most of it's underwater. You know, I get that. I mean, that makes perfect sense. But I think people underappreciate the importance of, of this whole, of this whole uh, system. Now... Like I said, fish farming is uh, a great uh, and important thing, but it sort of has one Achilles heel in terms of production of salmonid species and marine species, which is the, the vast majority of the, pro the fish species that are grown in, in, in fish farming, in, in aquaculture, is that you need to feed those fish omega-3 fish oils. So that seems a little bit sort of counterintuitive, but the problem is that fish oils are not made by fish. I mean, who knew? I mean, that's... But it's not a very helpful nomenclature. But in fact, the, the, it, out there in the marine, in, in the wild environment, the primary producers of omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are the marine microbes, the algaes, the diatoms, all these little organisms that form the base of the food web. And they're the organisms that are making the fatty acids that will ultimately then move up through multiple layer, trophic layers in the food web and are accumulated by the fish. So that's the, that's the problem. So fish, marine fish, and the salmonid species don't have a capacity to make omega-3 fish oils. They don't do it. They only get it through their diet. So that's okay out in the marine, in the wild environment. But if you're in a pen, it, there, there's, there, there's only one trophic level. It's you, the fish, and the farmer. And so if the farmer's not feeding you the right diet, then the fish that are produced via that process don't have the omega-3 fatty acids. So that's why fish farming has become the primary consumer of all the fish oils that are harvested from the ocean. Go straight, they come out of the ocean, and they go back into the ocean. Now that might seem a bit stupid, but actually, like I said, fish farming and aquaculture is a really important way to produce protein. And it's now running at a very, very level, efficient level but it's still constrained by what you can take out of the ocean. So we take a million tons of fish oil out of the ocean every year. At least 75% of it goes back to feed fish. And that million tons is really fixed by quotas, and we can't produce any more. But fish farming is, is increasing, and the global population is increasing. So we need to find a solution. 
So that's where we decided uh, to think about trying to find a plant-based source of, of omega-3 fatty acids to try and meet, to basically fill this gap between what we need and what we've got. I'm just looking for a, a, a water, actually. That would be... Um, so this is a, a slide that I put up to try and... This, this is a sort of uh, revamped version of a slide we made, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago to capture the idea that we had about how to make omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids in, in transgenic plants. Uh, and, it, I mean, I think the first version I made of this was probably like a, a glass slide or something, so which probably that dates me. Um, I'll just put this down and then I'll kick it over, so that's for sure. So you can see, I mean, so the, so the idea is pretty straightforward, and it's seductively simple, which is that's, that would explain why it's taken us so long. Um, so these are the marine microbes. These are the things I said, that the base of the, 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 the food web in, in, in the marine environment, these are the organisms that are making omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these little, these diatoms and these green algae. And, and so the idea was, and it's incredibly straightforward and simple to say, okay, well, we'll just take the genes from these organisms and we'll put them in a transgenic plant and, uh, and then the plant, we could just regenerate the plant making the novel fatty acid trait in its seed oil. Uh, and that was the idea we had 20 plus years ago. So the fact that I'm still here talking about it tells you it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Uh, but, you know, I think we, I can tell you we've, we've made some, some progress. Now, one of the reasons why it turned out to be not quite so straightforward as we thought it was going to be is because the metabolic pathway is quite complicated. So plants normally make uh, up to this level here, these 18 carbon fatty acids with two or three double bonds, and they're either omega-6 or omega-3. Uh, and so we've got to engineer the plants to, con to, make, to convert these substrates all the way down to here to make EPA or ideally DHA as well. A mixture of EPA and DHA would be ideal. But we only want to really make it on the omega-3 track, and we don't want to make it on the omega-6 track, because omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids sort of work in uh, opposition to each other, if you like. So you really, and, and certainly in fish oils, you don't find any omega-6 fatty acids. So you, you need to make, try and blend, uh, engineer your plants to make seed oils that are containing really only these omega-3 things. And that in itself is pretty tricky because most seed oils make a mixture of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids because, in fact, the omega-3 fatty acid, uh, alpha-linolenic acid, is the product of, uh, of desaturation of the omega-6 form. So it's, it's, you, it's always unlikely that you'll get complete conversion of omega-6 to omega-3 forms. So if it sounds like I'm making excuses for why we haven't made a lot of progress, you, you'll sort of get the, get the general gist. So, and it gets more complicated because metabolism, metabolism is complicated and lipid metabolism is, is, is complicated uh, uh, as well because in the previous slide I showed you the biosynthetic pathway of how you convert alpha-linolenic acid all the way to EPA and DHA. And that's sort of working, if you think of it working in sort of in, in a vertical plane, and simultaneously to that, you have fatty acids being moved around from different, uh, different, lipid different lipids uh, being moved around by enzymes that are present in the seed, and they're moving the fatty acid from, from one lipid, say, for example, uh, phosphatidylcholine, they're moving it into the acyl-CoA pool, or they're moving it into neutral lipids, or they're moving it in, uh, into a free fatty acid. So that all of these enzymes that are present are sort of moving your fatty acid from one position, from one lipid class to another. So if I told you the biosynthetic part is, is vertically, you could think about this as working in the horizontal plane. And it's doing that for every single step on that biosynthetic pathway. That makes things complicated, and, and why it's important is that because some of the enzymes that we're interested in, they'll only work on the substrate, on the fatty acids, in, in particular, uh, particular lipids or particular pools. So the, the elongation steps will only work in the acyl-CoA pool, and the desaturation steps will only work in the, the phospholipid pools. So if fatty acids are being moved around, you're sort of, you could have the best enzymes in the world that you've added into your, into your plant, but if the substrate's not in the right metabolic pool, then the whole thing's not going to work, as we discovered. So it, it, it makes things complicated. And, and a lot of this, I'm telling you this story sort of retrospectively, we've had to learn a lot of this stuff. We've had to understand and learn it to try and, uh, to try and manipulate it. 
Um, so we were interested in this plant species, Camelina, and this was the species we chose for our engineering. Um, it's fantastically easy to transform. So you can d use floral dip uh, with, with, with Camelina, which sort of marks it out from pretty much uh, most, other, most other oilseed crop species. Uh, it's got a really short growing cycle. It's got a, a fatty acid profile that's sort of ideal for what we're looking for because it's mainly omega-3 fatty acids, uh, alpha linolenic acid, and it's not a commodity crop. And I think that's important because we want to produce a significant volume of, of transgenic plants making EPA and DHA, but we don't want to work at the commodity scale. So I don't want to grow five million hectares of transgenic uh, plants making EPA and DHA because that's, I don't think that's the scale that is needed for, for the industry. If you remember, I told you the number was about a million tonnes is what we take of fish oil out of the ocean now. So if you, you probably need something like maybe half a million hectares or three quarters of a million hectares of plants to produce a, an equivalent volume to what we're taking out of the oceans. Now that's not commodity scale. And if you're working with a transgenic plant, you need to think about how, that's, how you're going to grow your crop alongside similar crops, but with, not with the same trait. So that's why I think it's important. Uh, and then so we just set up this sort of virtuous circle of trying to uh, do our engineering and I'm sort of going to skip through all of this and if you want to talk about the metabolic engineering I can do it's sort of quite it's interesting but it's also quite dull it's a bit sort of like sort of molecular biology Lego in some respects uh, uh, but I can talk about it if you're interested so we just set up this cycle which was a sort of you know, uh, design your construct, transform the plants, screen them, do some lipidomics to try and understand things better, and then just rebuild and go around and around in this circuit. So it's a sort of learning by doing thing, you know, which is, which is hard. Uh, you know, and we're building, these are big cassettes that we're building to put into plants. And this, we started doing this engineering at least 10 years ago before we had any of the tools that we have now. So people take for granted that you have nice Moclo Golden Gate type assembly systems. We didn't have any of that. We're using a much more pro proto prototypic system, trying to build up these cassettes that have got huge numbers of parts in them. So each gene, each enzyme activity has its own independent promoter and terminator. So you, you're building it up to try and uh, build up a whole range of permutations to try and find the best combina combination. And then, as we say, we're doing this you know, systematically evaluating a number of gene combinations. So this was the, one of our first experiments where you have a core set of activities that you don't change, and then you add in more different ones. But this is, this is hard, and it's time-consuming to do it. Even if you've got Camelina working really quickly as a transformation system, you still have to build these cassettes and then test them and understand what it is you've generated. Because actually, sometimes you can learn more by, by the, the plants that don't actually do what you want them to do you can look at them and say, okay, what can I learn from this? And you can learn a lot when you go into the lipidomics to try and understand what the situation is. Uh, and this is just some of, you know, this, this is the first iterations that we did from, from four or five years ago, trying to make plants, camelina plants, to make, for example, we're trying to make them EPA, which is the first important uh, long-chain omega-3 fatty acid. And this is a wild-type camelina fatty acid profile. It's, the, it's just a pie chart equivalent of the profile you saw earlier. Uh, this is what we're comparing stuff against. This is this is a, 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 a actually it's a good a good fish oil. It's a, it's uh, about uh, a one to one ratio of EPA and DHA, nearly 25% of the total fatty acids. That's what we're trying to compete against. What we're benchmarking against. And so you can see that you can in, in this iteration here you can make at least 25% EPA, maybe more. Uh, that's a really really sort of that's a, a, a quite impressive accumulation of that fatty acid. Uh, and you can do the same thing trying to make EPA and DHA, same sort of comparison. And what you can see now is you make EPA and DHA to almost exactly the same levels you find in a, in a good quality fish oil. So that's, uh, that, that I think is really, really uh, a, a, a quite an impressive achievement, even if I say so myself. What's nice about it is that, that it's quite clean. There are no intermediates accumulating here that, that might be problematic. And, and we've gone on and used these oils to try and uh, evaluate them in both, uh, uh, well, we've evaluated them in aquafeed trials. So we're interested in using these oils in, in fish farming. And so we've actually, therefore, actually used these plants to generate enough oil to do salmon feeding trials and sea bream trials and, and equivalent trials in, in some other species to demonstrate the efficacy, which is really important. You know, you can do all this stuff, but if you don't know it works, you can't just say, well, trust me, I'm pretty sure it'll work. I think you have to do the experiments to show that it does work. 
Uh, and this is what the plants look like. They look completely normal, which is a relief, but I mean, it's not surprising because they're just using seed-specific promoters. So we're only accumulating the fatty acids in the seeds of the transgenic plants. So it's not surprising at all that they look, they look exactly the same. And you can use our lipidomics to really profile the plants to say, okay, what's in there? Is, are they doing what you expect them to do? I mean, what's interesting is this is just a range that you see of, of for example, EPA or EPA and DHA. And you can see that there is, there is variation. I mean, this is a single seat analysis, so it's not surprising. But it's not, it's not sort of the, the range is what you might expect, so it's not ridiculous. And you can, look at, you can look at how the fatty acids are accumulating. You can prove that they're accumulating in triacylglycerol. And that's where we want it to be. We want it to be in the seed oil because it's really important that it's in the oil in the seed because we want to use, basically we want to have our engineered plants that can be treated just like any other normal oil seed and you can extract the oil in a, in a normal fashion. And you can do even more sophisticated stuff with our lipidomics platform. So this is just analyzing all the different triacylglycerol species in the seed. Uh, and this is a really horrendous trace because there's, there's hundreds of peaks in here. Uh, and, and this is just telling you all the different combinations of fatty acids that are in the triacylglycerol species. There are some here that have got three EPAs in them. So there's EPA at every single position in triacylglycerol. I don't understand how that is made, but it, it's present, and it's present at a reasonable amount. So it tells you that there's a lot of metabolism going on that we don't even understand yet. So, but if you want to manipulate things, I think it's really important that you at least have, a, have an attempt to understand it. So what, what have we learned from this? I think it, it, it tells me that you can, you know, we can, we can make EPA and DHA, we can make fish oils in plants at levels that are of significance, uh, uh, but we actually haven't really manipulated any aspect of this pathway. We've just put the biosynthetic genes in and sort of crossed our fingers and hoped that it was going to work, that all this stuff, because this is the really important stuff that takes the fatty acids and moves it into the triacylglycerol, would work. So we haven't touched that at all. Uh, but, and that's, if you think about the metabolism that's in a seed, there's, th this is probably several hundred genes worth of activity going on here. We've put six or seven genes in. So we've sort of obsessed about a small number of the total percentage of the activities in the seed. So it's sometimes you can look in the wrong direction. But I think to, maybe the important thing is it, it works. Uh, and it works to, to a level that is, that is, that is meaningful. But I don't think we're doing this in a predictive fashion. We're doing it in an iterative fashion, which is okay if your system allows you to do it iteratively. But to me, the, the, the challenge and academic challenge would be to get to a point where I can do my manipulations in a predictive fashion. So I can do an in silico analysis before I make my transgenic plants. Right, I don't know what the time is because I haven't got a, how are we doing time-wise? I've only got another 73 slides. So that's a joke. <laughs> 13 minutes, perfect. 13. So this, uh, so this is a, so this is why we did an experiment, and this we got a very interesting and slightly worrying result. So we're using this is a slice. These are uh, uh, camelina seeds, and they're accumulating either EPA or DHA. And we're using a technique called uh, Maldi MSI, uh, Maldi MS imaging, to to ask the machine to identify every single one of those tag species that I showed you on the previous slide. And so the tag species are just the fatty acids that are being incorporated into oil. And the ones at the top here are, are just the normal, uh, these are fatty acids that, that you find normally in the camelina seeds. And you can see that they're, they're dispersed, uh, distributed across the whole section of the seed. When you get down to here, these are the, these are the triacylglycerol species that are containing our omega-3 fish oils. And what you can see is that they're really quite restricted in their accumulation. In, in the seed. Uh, and uh, they're, they're accumulating mainly at uh, what I think is the radical part of the, uh, of the seed. Now, this is not a consequence of the promoters that we're using, because the promoters are expressed all the way through this seed. But for some, there is some other factor constraining the accumulation of these omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids just in this particular part of the seed. Same in here with these EDHA lines. So this tells you there's an opportunity to, to engineer the plants to accumulate more. Uh, if we could understand what is the rate limiting factor that's stopping them, the, the fatty acids being accumulated and tag in, 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 these seed, in these sections of the seed as well. So that's, that's really exciting. It's a real opportunity to do some discovery science as well on this point. Um, 
Uh, so one thing I want to talk about is that, is that you know, we're, we're interested in this technology. Other people are interested in this technology as well. There are, there are, uh, there are two other uh, uh, much bigger and better funded research groups working in this area to try and make omega-3 long-chain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in canola. Uh, so BSF and Cargill uh, and also New Seed CSRO. Uh, and, and I put this slide up, because, so this is data from, it's publicly available data, so this is data for, for either uh, the, the CSRO um, canola line or the BSF canola lines. Uh, and what's, what's really interesting is that, so the, 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 the new seed CSRO line mainly makes DHA, and the BSF line makes, m makes mainly e EPA. Now the reason I put this up, and I think it's really strange, is they've put the same pathway in as we've put into our transgenic carmelina. In fact, I think on the next slide, you can just see a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, and what, you, what this sort of like, the, the fact that all these lines are all over the place, tells you that actually, again, we're some way off predictive mani manipulation of, ma of, of, of lipid metabolism in a transgenic plant. Because in my carmelina, I can make EPA and DHA if I put the pathway into the plants. If EP, uh, with, with BSF, they mainly make EPA, and with D, uh, CSRO, they mainly make DHA in canola. Uh, and there's some other stuff going on as well. It's this, the, the, the BSF line has very high uh, 18.2, and the, the CSRO line has very high 18.3. So I guess all I'm just the point I'm trying to make is not, I'm, it's not to say that my product is, is better than theirs, because it is, but anyway, that's not the point that I'm making. The point is that we are some way off having predictive man manipulation of lipid metabolism in plants, and I think there's still, there's still a lot to learn. But we just want to try and, you know, we, so we, we're building new constructs using new assembly systems. We want to use some of the DNA foundry systems that are based up in, based in, in the UK to, to, to assemble these constructs in a much more systematic and almost combinatorial fashion uh, to try and move things further along. And we, we've sort of started doing this already, and you can make a, a range of transgenic plants that accumulate different combinations of EPA and DHA, or just EPA or EPA and DPA. You can do this, so we're sort of inching towards this predictable aspect of things. And we're also taking all of this data and working with computational biologists from the University of Dusseldorf to try and see if we can actually model this to try and understand uh, what it is so we don't have to run so many iterations. So in the last bit, I'm just going to spend five minutes talking about the work that we've been doing about uh, doing GM field trials at Rothamsted. And, it, and I wanted to talk about this because I think it's important uh, to, to, to say, you know, people in Europe do do GM field trials. That they, uh, it's really important to do GM field trials because if you just carry on doing your work in the lab, you'll never know whether your application, your work is going to your product is going to work in, in the real world. So moving into the field is really important. It took me a long time to realize that but I'm really glad that we did start to do field trial experiments. Um, and this is, I like this picture because this is a picture of our uh, field trial site at Rothamsted. You can see we've got very impressive fences and a very impressive security guard. And, uh, uh, and this is somebody taking photos of people going in and out of the, out of the compound. And, and you could be forgiven for thinking that this is like some sort of protest or somebody, but this is in fact a, a camera person from the BBC. And she's filming uh, uh, what we're doing because they were making a documentary about this about doing GM field trials, which I think was a good thing to do because we wanted to demonstrate that we've got nothing to, you know, we've got nothing to hide. We're quite happy for people to, to know about what we're doing. Uh, and this is, our, this is a, an aerial shot of, of our GM field trial site. This is one of my Camelina trials. Uh, and it looks very impressive, but what, actually I find it quite depressing because we've got all these fences around our trials. I would much rather I was doing my trial out here on the rest of the Rothamsted farm. That would make my life a lot easier uh, because this cr creates an impression that this is something dangerous or, I don't know, risky behind these fences. We've got all these nets over the crops. That, to me, that's the wrong message. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd like to be able to move away from doing, those, doing these trials in that fashion. But as it is, you know, I think you have to explain to people why you're doing the trials as much as you can. And, you know, we spend a lot of time at Rothamsted with my Camelina trial and also with the GM wheat trial that we did before, which, which John Pickett was, was, was uh, involved in with his, his project. Uh, and that Morris helped a lot with as well in terms of the communications. But if you, if you try to be as open as possible and you put the message out there and explain to anybody who, who asks why you're doing it, then you know, there's an opportunity to, to move away from the sort of tedious 
you know, media coverage of sort of franken food and you know everything being being terrible to something that's maybe a bit more positive. So, you know, this was you know some headlines for when we started doing our trials. You know, GM superfoods to be grown in Britain. I don't think that's a negative headline. GM crops and sustainable source of healthy fish feeds for farms. I think that's a positive positive message. You know, when the trial was finished, so we published our results. It's really important to publish your results to demonstrate that you're being open and transparent. Uh, again, you know, fish oil made from plants to be savior of the oceans. Now, I'm quite a hyperbolic person, but even I would draw the line at describing our trial that involved nearly 200 square meters of transgenic camelina as being the saviors of the ocean. But the point I always make about this slide is that you know this is, this is a graphic that the Times newspaper made. We didn't give them this graphic, they made it. And to me, it explains really nicely what it is that we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. So to me, that tells me that we must have explained our message really clearly. You know, or, well, it wasn't me, it would have been you know, my, my, my colleague from the, from the comms team. She explained it really well. But that, that to me tells me that we're doing something right. It, it, the, you know, the, that we're not spin doctors, I'm not interested in spinning a story. But I do, want the, I do want the information to be presented in a clear and useful fashion so that the journalists can write a story. And I don't like people slagging off journalists and saying, oh, they've misrepresented my science. It's like, well, maybe you didn't explain it very well. Right. Uh, so this is some nice pictures of our field trials, you know, so we carry on doing, doing the field trials and trying to move them to bigger scales. I, think, I, I do believe it's really important to test your technology in the field, especially for, for GM. You know, we're the only people that have been doing GM trials year on, year out now for most of this decade. And I don't think, you know, I think it's, and that's a worry to me that people in, in UK universities, you know, feel constrained from doing, testing their technology in the field. Maybe their university doesn't even have the facilities to do the trials. But I think it's something we need to get back into the habit of doing. Uh, and then, and then we've, we've moved to do bigger trials. So this is like uh, two hectares that we grew last year in Manitoba. We're growing some more in Manitoba. Uh, uh, this year, so that allows us to do to produce large amounts of material that we can then crush and use in big salmon feeding trials. So to me, this is another advantage of working in the field. You can produce a lot of material to test. So we can do a lot of collaborative experiments with people interested in aquafeed trials or human intervention studies or animal feeding studies. If you have the material from working in the field, then you can do those collaborative experiments. And those are useful results to get. Uh, and so just to, to wrap up, uh, at Rotham said, I'm the uh, uh, leader of the Omega-3 flagship, which sounds terribly gr uh, glamorous, but in fact, it's sort of more like a canoe, basically, than a flagship, because it's really only me paddling it, I think, would be the way to describe it. Um, but, uh, and, and I stupidly uh, coined this phrase, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, but it sounded good at the time. Uh, but it's really about trying to, to, to move the research from, from a started as blue skies, move it to, we've done the proof of concept, the demo, so we, how do you commercialize it? That's the question. We've got a prototype and we know that it works uh, and, and people are interested in it, but how do you commercialize publicly funded research, especially publicly funded research that uses genetically modification? I think these are, these, are, these are difficult questions because it would be easy to license the technology to a big company, but then it goes into the private sector and you maybe lose control of it. I think for a technology like GM, especially in Europe, there's an advantage for that to remain in the public sector. So, so you can say, look, you know, this was developed by the taxpayer, it's still owned by the taxpayer, and the benefit will come back to the taxpayer in a more transparent fashion. Anyway, that's my little hobby horse. So, uh, so this is the take home messages. Uh, we have a proven platform that, that's capable of producing superior levels of EPA and DHA. Uh, so we've agri agriculturally validated with field trials in the UK and in North America, in Canada and in the US. Uh, and we've done significant aquafeed studies with salmon, sea bream and bass. We've done a human intervention study. We've fed the stuff to mice. Uh, we've done a lot of work that demonstrates that the, that the efficacy, the equivalence of this to fish oil, because we want to make a drop-in equivalent to fish oil, so you just take the fish oil out and you put the vegetable oil in, our GM camelina oil. And really, I think we've demonstrated that that works. Uh, so, and of course, uh, I just talk about this stuff. I didn't do the work. Uh, the people who really did the work, so Li Wa Han is a sort of superhuman technician that I have, and she works does a lot of the field work, she does a lot of uh, work in the lab, she's fantastic. Olga uh, has paid a, played a massive role in this project from its inception in 
1843 or whenever it is we started. Uh, and uh, Richard and Noy have worked a lot on this project. And this is another picture of, of, of our fish farm up in Ardniche. And if you've got eagle eyes, you'll see this, which is a steam train. This, that's the Harry Potter Express that runs from uh, Fort William to Maleg. And so when we were filming, the, the train runs across there. there. So that's, a, that's an, a rather nice little thing as well. Okay, oh, and I should have said, these are the guys that we work with at Sterling who are fantastic collaborators. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.